So as well as being a massive space geek, I am also a huge sci-fi nerd as well. Mostly though I read a lot of sci-fi, so I love like Pierce Brown's Red Rising series recently. I thought that was absolutely amazing because it's kind of that crossover between like sci-fi and fantasy. But because I read so much, it does mean that I am a little bit behind on my TV watching. So as an astrophysicist, I obviously do love sci-fi, but also I have to turn off that side of my brain that's sort of very critical of what's actually happening to just sort of sit back and enjoy it. But today I figured I'd turn on that side of my brain again and watch Netflix's Lost in Space because I haven't seen it yet and I've heard that it is really good. And we can go through it together and figure out which bits are the bits that make sense and which bits are a bit more sci-fi than science. Object office discovered so she just said the near earth object office which is kind of close to real life like nasa actually has something called the center for near earth object studies which is tasked with finding all of the asteroids that have orbits that bring them close to earth and could possibly potentially impact with earth and keep track of those things as well i mean currently we don't have anything that we think is gonna hit earth there is something that's gonna come within the orbits of weather satellites in April of 2029. Uh, and all that information comes from CNEOS. So I'm intrigued now to see what this near earth object office has found. A sizable unknown celestial object that's headed our way. So she just said sizable celestial object, which is not exactly very precise. If this were a real news story, NASA would definitely give out the estimated size of the object given the observations they have and how bright it appears. So for example, the size would tell you whether the damage that this this asteroid could make is either local damage or more of a continental damage or more of a global damage instead. So something over like 300 meters would be something where, you know, the entire planet would be at risk. So I'm assuming since you said sizable, that's what they're going for. But like, I mean, even in astronomy terms, sizable is a bit woolly, you know, sizable could mean something the size of Jupiter's coming. This planet is unlike any we have ever mapped. Wherever we are, I it's a Goldilocks planet, Earth-like atmosphere, air pressure, gravity, clearly no lack of water. It's, the odds of that happening are, it's, it's like winning the lottery. So she mentions the Goldilocks zone there, which is the area around a star which is not too hot and not too cold for life to exist. So she said she's surprised that A, they've not found this planet before, they've never mapped it out. Obviously they've been searching for habitable planets, otherwise they probably wouldn't have launched off into space with nowhere to go. Um, and yeah, she's right, the odds of finding one and happening upon a habitable planet are really, really small. If you think about, you know, the fact that you need a star, first of all, that isn't too hot, it's not like an O star, which is incredibly, incredibly hot, and not too cool and small, which is just like a red star. And then you've also managed to find a planet that's happened to have formed in the perfect area around that star, wherever you are in the galaxy as well. Like, yeah, the odds are extremely slim. I mean, when we crashed, we must have scraped open a pure vein of it. Yeah, vein of what? Magnesium. Magnesium burns hot, but you know what makes it burn hotter? Ice. Judy? I gotta go get something. You're leaving? He'll help get you out. I'll be back. So they're gonna go hunting for magnesium in order to find something to melt the ice, which, as like implausible as it sounds, I guess it's not that implausible. Magnesium is definitely in like the top 10 most abundant elements in the universe, so it's not unreasonable that they might find some on this random planet. And guiding the way is basically it's burning with this really bright white light. Uh, magnesium always gives off that really bright light. It's kind of very strong in the ultraviolet as well. So it's used a lot in like fireworks and like stage explosions and stuff like that because it's really easy to set it on fire if it's like a powder or if it's um, like shavings, but as like a solid lump, it's a little bit difficult, but it's especially easy if you put it into water or on ice, which clearly this planet is covered in. So. That's why they've been able to spot it. Penny, how much air does she have left? 68 minutes. Judy, close your eyes. Keep them close. Ah. Yeah. 
So he's managed to find some magnesium, which now he's burning on the top of this water ice to try and free this kid stuck in the ice, which, okay, sounds like a great idea, but when you react magnesium with water, you produce hydrogen gas, which is one of the most flammable things. And so you, you've currently got a fire in a re above a reaction that's producing something that's incredibly flammable. So I think they should be standing a little bit further back from this reaction, but also I still don't understand how the kid underneath is going to survive. A, the heat that the water is going to get to as it melts. B, like the fact that it's going to be super flammable and probably explode at some point. And then also see, he just told her to close her eyes because it would be so bright. She's so close to that magnesium flame. Even when we did this at school where they burnt the magnesium in one of those extractor chambers, like it was incredibly bright when you were stood even like a couple of meters away from it. So I think she's really going to like burn her retina here as well. Okay, so this kid's been rescued from this fire by this weird alien robot thing. Like, I'm not entirely sure. I think it might be kind of like a cyborg -y style thing. Like, it's got some biomechanics stuff in there. And I always find it really interesting, like, what people choose to go with when they picture, like, alien life. Because it is something that we study in astrophysics, too. There is a branch of astrophysics called astrobiology, which mainly is considers like how habitable a planet is in terms of like you know whether it's in the Goldilocks zone and what's in its atmosphere and what kind of life you could have developing there given what constitutes its atmosphere you know how much oxygen nitrogen hydrogen etc there is so people often consider what aliens could be made of so we as humans and other organisms on earth are carbon-based life forms that means most of the molecules that are the building blocks of our bodies are carbon based but the other element that you could sort of use as sort of one of these building blocks to make all of these life molecules is also silicon as well so people often consider silicon based life forms so it's really interesting to think whether maybe this cyborg thing is like a silicon based life form i'm still not sure whether it's like a, a local to this planet that they've landed on or whether it's from this weird crash landed ship that he found as well i'm like i'm really intrigued Okay, so this alien just seems to be magically heating this ice that magnesium could only burn a small hole through. Magnesium burns at like a thousand degrees and above. So I don't understand how this alien is doing it. He's just like holding his hands above it and all of a sudden the ice is heating up. I mean, I guess this is one of those things that I'm just gonna have to take with a pinch of salt. Can you do something so we don't freeze? <laughs> So this kid's just said, like, can you do something so we don't freeze? And the cyborg's just kind of gone, okay, I'll be your space heater. It very much looks like he's got, like, an infrared kind of glow coming from inside of him. So perhaps that's how he melted the ice, just from pure heat energy. I still think it possibly would have had to be incredibly concentrated to melt that large amount of ice and get the kid out of the ice. But again, that at least solves that problem they've gone with kind of an infrared -y space heater kind of thing. But okay. Oh, okay, so crazy alien space heater guy was apparently part of the aliens that attacked their ship, which is obviously what went wrong in the first place. Plot twist. <laughs>
So I'm really confused by that ending. Like, first of all, all their engines shut off at once, and then the whole ship that was being destroyed fell into this weird space color stuff that didn't seem to be anything, but then it seemed to disappear, or if it just cut to black, I'm not sure. So I'm really confused. Like, where were they going in the first place? Uh, on that spacecraft because they didn't end up where they were supposed to because it wasn't a planet that they'd actually mapped. I'm really confused. I'm going to read up on this. A few moments later. Oh, right. Okay. So apparently they were supposed to be heading to the Alpha Centauri system, which is the nearest star system to Earth. It's about four light years away. There's three stars in the system, Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. Now we have found planets around Proxima Centauri. There's definitely Proxima Centauri B, which has been confirmed, and there's a candidate planet at the minute called Proxima Centauri C as well. Proxima Centauri though is a kind of a red dwarf star, so it's not very hot. So any planet that is going to be in the habitable zone is going to have really short orbits to keep it close enough to the star that it's going to be warm enough for life to exist. So perhaps whenever this is taking place, I don't know, like a, a hundred maybe years into the future, uh, they've found other planets around Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B that they think might be habitable and that's why they've gone to try and colonize it. But the Alpha Centauri system is four and a half light years away and even if they could travel at say 10% of the speed of light, which is a push at today's standards in terms of spacecraft, you know, they would still take 45 years to get there. So the idea that they can go as a family is a bit strange. So they obviously must have some way of getting there really, really fast, like within a couple of years to sort of stay that youthful of a family. The fact that they've then landed on another planet is really weird. They must, that, oh, that colorful spacey thing at the end, was that, is that going to turn out to be some sort of wormhole thing? It's probably what they always use in sci-fi, right? Is wormholes or hyperspace or whatever. 12 seconds later... Oh, okay, right. So the colorful space thing at the end was actually a wormhole. So wormholes are used often in sci-fi because plot, you need to get your characters from one side of the universe to the other pretty quickly. And a wormhole is supposedly like a bridge between those two parts of space, which does sound really sci-fi-y, but in fact, like, it's actually a theoretical or mathematical object, if not one that we've detected in the real universe yet. So wormholes are actually a product of Einstein's general relativity. So Einstein said, we can think of gravity as the curving of space-time. If you have taut space-time and you put a object of some mass on it, the space-time will curve according to how heavy that object is, so that stuff traveling on that space-time will then go on the curved surface. It's what makes planets go around stars, stars go around the center of the galaxy. And so the equations that describe that, that Einstein came up with, have gravity on one side and then the curvature of space on the other side. And actually one of the solutions to those equations is actually a wormhole, uh, where two points in space that are, you know, light years apart are actually connected by the fact that space has bent so much to connect the two of them. So in astrophysics, we actually call that an Einstein-Rosen bridge rather than a wormhole. But you know, sci-fi has got to get its ideas from somewhere. And sometimes nature does have the best ideas in the first place, even if we've not actually been able to detect one of these wormholes, which would be quite difficult. It'd be similar to detecting a black hole where you know no light is coming from it. So the only way we could detect it is by its effect on space and the fact that it curves space-time so that any light coming from behind it would get bent and perhaps we'd be able to detect it that way. Perhaps when we see black holes that cause these little lensing events, as we call them, where we brighten the background objects because of the bending of space-time, maybe those things are little micro wormholes, but we just don't know it. It's one of those things that I think, at least in our lifetime, is going to remain only a mathematical object, like something that's completely theoretical, but you know, never say never. So yeah, if you like that, let me know in the comments what other TV series or movies you want me to react to, and I'll have a scroll through and see if there's any I haven't seen before. But until then, I think I'm gonna be watching episode two. Like Pierce Brown's Red Rising series, I absolutely loved recently. Um, but would blah, 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 blah. I love that we're listening to Uncle Cracker during like family space game time. <laughs> I mean, that spacecraft they're in looks distinctly Millennium Falcon-like. I wonder where they got the inspiration from. Ooh, we got like Avatar-style animals going on here. I'm really expecting the crazy alien thing to just like poof, out a load of fire and just kill this weird butterfly thing. Ooh, thank you, drink slave. <laughs> <laughs> Wine time.